Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau tihe Māori ora. E na mana, e na reo, a ora raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnei te raru o te maru o ka mana whenua, ka te māmo e waitaha o um, kaitahu, no mai, hara mai tauti mai. Uh, I stand here under the umbrella of the people of this place, uh, ka te māmo e waitaha, kaitahu, and welcome you here. Uh, no Ōtu Poti Ahau, um, ko Katarani te iwi, he kaimahi ahau uh, o tāko whaka ihu waka, uh, ko Richard Blakey tāko ingoa. Um, my name is Richard Blakey, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise. I'm uh, here representing the Vice-Chancellor tonight to be your MC for this wonderful event celebrating an inaugural professorial lecture for Lisa McNeil. Um, it is uh, it is a wonderful celebration of what we are as a university that we we get together to celebrate uh, promotion to the highest academic rank. Um, uh, ki te rangatira, uh, uh, e araki a uh, te nakoto, uh, ki te manuhiri o, o te tafarewana o Otago, uh, o te poti, um, uh, te wai panemu e te hoe fa uh, no mai hara mai welcome again. So to those that are here from our academic party, greetings to members of the university staff, uh, members of the public of Dunedin, visitors from the Four Winds, including those uh, online and in the future that are watching this, welcome, welcome, thrice welcome, and particular welcome to your special guests, Lisa, uh, Hamish, uh, Roman, and Ethan. I understand from a reliable source that one of you uh, ran here after a first half of a football match, so that's showing good dedication, and that, that person also scored, I think, quote, a screamer of a goal. So can we all congratulate, uh, uh, I think it was Ethan, on a, a great performance in this football match. Um, oh, come on, let's all congratulate him, it was a great... <laughs> Um, but to more serious and academic matters, uh, and actually we, we do like these to be celebrations. We have high standards for ourselves as a university. We want to achieve excellence in what we do. And so promotion to the rank of professor has to demonstrably be um, something where excellence is articulated through uh, teaching, research and service and we uh, will scrutinise very carefully, I'm very glad I'm not on the academic staffing committee or the scrutineering process, uh, performance of people who wish to be considered for that promotion, uh, we will use international referees and we will um, make sure that those standards are met to the highest level. And so with Lisa tonight, we are celebrating that you have achieved those standards and uh, met them very, very well. Um, I just want to talk very briefly. Uh, so the, the order of proceedings is that um, Lisa's Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Marie Tyne, will give a more formal introduction. Lisa will give her presentation. Uh, Professor Rob Lawson will give a vote of thanks, and then we'll have time for for fellowship at the staff club. But I just want to set the scene by um, acknowledging some of the contributions you've made, Lisa, particularly in the interactions that I've had with you in your role as Associate Dean Postgraduate Research. Um, it's a role that you've uh, undertaken willingly and uh, with good humor at times when we've got difficult matters in postgraduate research to deal with. And you've kept uh, continuity in that role through multiple terms, so thank you for that service. Um, but I also acknowledge that when I look at your, uh, your, your CV, you um, balance that service very well with uh, the role as a teacher, a researcher, a mentor, a collaborator, any one of which could take up one's full time. So you're a very popular teacher and supervisor, many students, uh, you are, your research and supervision is characterized by how collaborative it is, including with faculties outside commerce into, into medicine and other areas. And in particular, you focus on issues of importance, such as consumer sustainability sus perspectives, that we, um, that I recognize were ahead of their time, but are perspectives that are, are very much needed uh, for, for the presence, and that is also the characteristic of a high quality professor, is that they can identify issues in their discipline that the world will need, in many cases well ahead of them becoming popular and, uh, and topical issues. So um, on behalf of the university, Lisa, congratulations on your well-deserved promotion. Uh, and as uh, Marie Tyne comes up here to give you the more formal introduction, can everyone please join me in congratulating you on this well-deserved promotion. Thank you very much.
Professor Blakey, Tenakwe. Professor McNeil, Tenakwe. Professor Lawson, Tenakwe. Roman, Ethan, and Hamish, Tenakoto. Friends and colleagues, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kotoa. Kia ora, ko Marie Tain Toko Ingoa. I have the privilege of being the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Division of Commerce, the division in which the department that Lisa is based, the marketing department. And it is my pleasure to warmly welcome you all here today for Professor McNeil's professorial lecture. Lisa McNeil was promoted to professor in February of this year, and tonight we come together to celebrate this awesome occasion. Professor McNeil completed a BA majoring in English and a BCom first class honours in marketing and then a PhD entitled Retail Sales Promotion in the Supermarket Industry. This research produced a framework for sales promotion success in the supermarket industry based on an analysis of industry cases from within food manufacturing and retailing. Professor McNeil concluded her thesis that channel issues such as trust and the sharing of objectives are vital to the successful use of sales promotions in the supermarket. Please come in. <laughs> Elaine, I'm not going to leave you standing there. You've got to come in. In the supermarket retail environment, and she suggested relationship marketing techniques to be used by channel members to achieve alignment of sale promotion goals, and I'm sure we'll hear more of this tonight. While completing her PhD, Professor McNeil was employed as a research assistant and, a, and an assistant lecturer in the Department of Marketing until taking on the position of lecturer in 2004. She was then promoted up through the ranks to senior lecturer, then associate professor, and then to full professor. Professor McNeil was the director of the International Business Programme in the Division of Commerce from 2009 until 2013, and in 2019, she took the role on of the associate dean postgraduate, which she, fortunately for us, still holds today. As already stated, a promotion to full professor at the University of Otago is not taken lightly. You must excel in all three areas, research, teaching, and service. And Professor McNeil has undoubtedly achieved this. Professor McNeil is a consumer behaviorist, an expert in cultures of consumption and consumer identity, and a leader in research on sustainable fashion consumption. Indeed, her 2015 examination of people's relationships with fashion and sustainability is internationally considered a seminal piece of work. And further, her recent published work where she applies a developmental theory to a fashion context, exploring hedonic, social, and sacrificial notions of needs versus wants, is one of the top 10 downloaded publications for 2020 in the International Journal of Consumer Studies. Professor McNeil is a founding member of the very active research group, the International Sustainable Fashion Consumption Research Group. Professor McNeil has an excellent publication record, publishing in top journals in her field. She serves on several editorial boards of highly ranked marketing and business journals, and she is the associate editor of another very highly ranked journal in our field. Not only are her publications very impressive, but she also ensures the dissemination of her research into the public domain through a variety of media outlets with an extremely impressive list of media commentaries over the past 10 years. Professor McNeil clearly fosters an international research collaborat collaborative reputation, evidenced by the international collaborations within her publications and the international research groups that she works in. Professor McNeil is an outstanding teacher, teaching across all levels. Her teaching is extremely well received by students. She is an excellent communicator and innovator of teaching material, having received excellent feedback and teaching accolades across and throughout her teaching career. 
Professor McNeil leads course design and development and has been instrumental in developing papers which draw in industry partners as part of the practical and assessment elements in her paper. Professor McNeil's teaching is research informed and applied and students respond very favourably to both the content and her focus on student success. Professor McNeil has supervised six PhD students to completion and is currently co-supervising another six. She supervises DBA students as well as Master of Commerce students and Master of Marketing students. Her, supervi her supervision is highly regarded amongst students. She was a Commerce Division finalist for the OUSA Supervisor of the Year Award in 2021. Having personally supervised with Professor McNeil, I find her to be an extremely professional, competent, caring and student focused supervisor and I thoroughly enjoy supervising with her. Professor McNeil's service com commitments have been wide reaching across the Department of Marketing, the Division of Commerce and the University as a whole. She has been, as we've heard, Associate Dean since, uh, of Postgraduate since March 2019 and in this role she provides academic and administrative leadership in all activities relevant to postgraduate research within our division. A major part of this role is to represent the Division of Commerce on many, many, many committees across the university. To name a few, Professor McNeil is actively engaged in the Board of Graduate Studies, Graduate Research Committee, Otago Scholarship Panel, Graduate Student Liaison Committee, Division of Commerce Proposals Committee, and the Division of Commerce uh, Divisional Board. And each of these committees have very large agendas. Not only is Professor McNeil heavily involved in the university service, but she actively contributes to the community through public lectures and involvement in industry initiatives such as the judging of the Young Enterprise Scheme, and she is also a fellow of St. Margaret's College. I have been fortunate enough to work with Professor Lisa McNeil for many years in the Department of Marketing. I have taught with Lisa, supervised research students with Lisa, sat on committees with Lisa, and even run a half marathon with Lisa. But that is another story. Come on. Lisa is someone who I have often sought advice from, and still do, on a number and variety of different matters. I have often picked her brain around course advice for our students. Lisa has always managed to retain all relevant information about course and program structure and can answer any question that you might have about a course path for a student. And I know that her advice is always correct. This aligns with what I believe to be an amazing skill that Lisa has, which I'm always in awe of her ability to retain and recite information when needed. It might be something like a policy around a scholarship or admissions for our students, or the required papers for a student wishing to complete an LLB and a BCom, or an article that her PhD students really must read, or it might be something topical in the media that day, or a general knowledge question. Lisa knows it, whatever it is. I envy that skill and I would love to be able to retain even a tiny amount of the information and knowledge that Lisa has. I don't know how she finds the time to stay abreast of everything just as well as she does. And I'd like to give you a small personal example that has always stuck with me and has usually and hugely touched me at the time. And I don't know if you remember this Lisa. But three years ago, my son was interviewed on Radio 1, and it was a really big deal for us. Uh, he was only 10 at the time, and the interview happened at 8 a.m. on Radio 1, so we were pretty sure the only people that were going to hear that interview were his mum and dad. <coughs> but no, I come to work that morning, or after I dropped him off at school after the interview, and here's Lisa. Was that Macklin interviewed on the radio this morning? What a great interview. I asked her, how could you have possibly have heard this? How do you know it, he was on the radio? And she said, well, when Roman and Ethan and I come into work and school in the mornings, we often listen to Radio 1. 
I was so impressed, but not at all surprised. Once again, Lisa, you're all over everything. A hugely enviable skill. A skill that I see permeates and clearly enriches her research, teaching and delivery of service roles and makes her an insightful and astute colleague, teacher and mentor. And I am now delighted to be able to warmly welcome Lisa up to give her inaugural professorial lecture. Please welcome Professor Lisa McNeil. Nā mihi nui. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. He mihi nui, he mihi mahana, kia koutou. Ko Lisa McNeil, tāku ingawa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Marie. And welcome. I appreciate your willingness to come and give up part of your evening. And I really do hope that you'll find something of interest in what I promise will be a very brief overview of how I got here and my research. So a trick that is often used by authors is to start at the end when writing a story. The theory is if you write the ending first, when you get lost, you can find your way back. I hope I won't get lost for your sake, but I am told that audiences really do like destinations, perhaps because you're all thinking secretly, are we there yet? So the destination that we're heading toward is my current research. We're not quite there yet, but we will get there with an overview of the path that I took and some of the work that I was interested in along the way. When I came to Otago University to study, I had never been to Dunedin. Although I do have an older brother who attended Otago University previously, and he had me very well versed in what it meant to be a student and live the student life here at Otago. I do think that probably his journey made my parents question the wisdom of ever sending another child here but here we are. Clearly they put some of those concerns aside. My first degree was a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature. And I really should emphasize, particularly for my commerce colleagues here, the luxury of gaining a degree by reading novels and talking about them. For this absolutely wonderful introduction to university study, I'm really indebted to the very special teachers that we have here in the English faculty at Otago, both past and present, who put amazing time and energy into the courses that they delivered. They fostered in me a lifelong appreciation of various authors and poets from many different disciplines. Classes by Professor Chris Ackerley, Dr. John Watson, Dr. John Hale, and the wonderful Dr. Bill Deans will always be remembered as some of the best that I have studied. Again, apologies, my commerce colleagues. Toward the end of my BA, prompted by concern to have a real job, I started a BCom. I figured that having some skills in writing would translate to commerce. It was storytelling, surely. And I have to thank Emeritus Professor Jennifer Black for encouraging me along this path. Some of those I knew from humanities likened this as a move to the dark side. Professor Rob Lawson, who's here today, was a very convincing course advisor, telling me that marketing was simply the best subject that one could possibly study in commerce, 
and that I would have a lot of fun along the way. The photo there, for those of you who might remember, is the infamous 300 level marketing camp for students and staff. I had some amazing marketing lecturers, one of whom is here tonight, Rob. And they proved Rob, the other Rob, correct on both counts. Marketing really is the best subject to study in commerce. Apologies, friends from other disciplines. But I should say, dark side or not, Rob is nothing like Darth Vader. After the BCom, it wasn't my intention to become an academic, but the opportunity of a PhD alongside an assistant lecturer position seemed like a good one. And here I really would like to express my appreciation for my wonderful supervisors, Professor Kim Pham, Professor Sarah Todd, and Professor Vivian Shaw. All of these were fantastic role models, fantastic mentors, and wonderful friends. I would like to pause here to mention two special colleagues and friends who are no longer with us. Many of you will remember Dr. James Henry and Dr. David Bishop. I had the great fortune of sharing teaching with both James and David throughout the years, and I think I can speak for our department when I say that we all miss you. We miss your enthusiasm for students, for marketing, and for life. My PhD, as Marie mentioned, gave me the opportunity to collect data in some of New Zealand's primary export markets. And through its consideration of sales and marketing tactics in food retail, opened my eyes to the inherent complexity of consumption. In my PhD, probably still influenced by my BA, I was interested in how the sometimes opposing objectives of retailers and manufacturers were communicated and used as sales tactics, as convincing stories within those markets. I was fortunate to receive support from Fonterra's predecessor, New Zealand Milk, in accessing their key Asian export markets, looking at New Zealand milk solids to explore this issue. It was also very fortunate to complete a PhD, having a wonderful time in Singapore and Malaysia and China and all of those much warmer places than Dunedin. A central finding of my PhD was that irrespective of firm objectives and cultural dissimilarity, the basic drivers for consumption amongst consumers remain the same. While the rest of my journey is not yet history, this interest in consumption marks the start of the research journey that has led me here today. So let's begin by thinking about my research. In Kundera's novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, the metaphor of heaviness is explored in relation to the burdening down of our earthly lives. Nietzsche suggested, however, that the heaviness of life could be either a tremendous burden or of great benefit, depending on the perspective of the individual. For some, possessions are inherently burdensome. For others, possessions represent a means to achieve their own lightness of being. The majority of my research from my PhD to date, has focused on understanding our relationship to our possessions and what those possessions mean for our identity. In 
In Dante's poem, the first part, Inferno, represents recognition. In terms of my research, this represents a growing understanding of the importance of possessions in the lives of people. This phase of my research could aptly be termed food, form and fashion. What I found during this period of trying to define the issue of consumption and materialism as part of identity construction is that our things, as irrelevant as they might seem to others, have special, deep and unique meaning to us as individuals. Often our things become artefacts of our very being, taking on meaning beyond the physical. Consider the bride who can't dispose of her wedding dress decades later, or your friend who holds on to their school tie, presumably because the blazer is too tight. Often identity finds its clearest expression via our clothing. So it is a significant area of interest for those of us who seek to understand the construction of people's identities through their possessions. However, to show overt interest in clothing is often derided, particularly in academic circles. For some, an interest in fashion is signalling the exact opposite of intellectualism. So I used this excerpt from Catherine Mansfield's personal letters as an illustration. Mansfield was known to be passionate about dress, both in her writing and in her personal life. It would be a brave academic to say that Mansfield lacked an intellect and she did not appear the least bit shameful about her passion for fashion. In any case, no one who has ever told me that to study fashion consumption is frivolous for an academic has been naked while doing so. Hopefully not, not today. Identity theory seeks to explain the specific meanings that individuals place on their identity and the artefacts that allow them to express themselves. Understanding how our consumption of things contributes to a sense of identity allows us to better understand an individual's concept of self and how they negotiate, control and display aspects of that self in a non-verbal manner. Here at Otago, I teach a course in innovation and design. Design-led thinking asks us to fall in love with problems. To really understand a market's needs. In design and innovation, being an expert in solutions is not as valuable as being an expert in the problems that necessitate those solutions. To some extent, design thinking is a good analogy to academia, where we might spend years defining a problem in order to understand its potential solutions. In these papers, which range across a number of forms and categories of buying, some insights helped me to crystallise a research theme that seeks to understand how individuals control their identity. Identity is controlled via the social and symbolic capital of consumption. So most of these papers sought to really dig into why people consumed in the ways that they did. In a study of grocery product choices, consumers cited buying well-known brands when food was going to be consumed publicly, but budget products for private consumption, unless the product was a personal treat or a personal reward 
then the most expensive brand is preferred. I should underscore the personal here. One participant in this study talked of buying two tubs of ice cream, one a gourmet brand, one a budget brand, and reversing the contents of those tubs, serving her family the budget ice cream in the gourmet tub and keeping the gourmet ice cream in the budget tub for her own consumption, <laughs> knowing that no one in the family would touch it. In another study, young home leavers used credit and debt services extravagantly when purchasing non-essentials such as clothing, alcohol, or even takeaway coffee. As these purchases were deemed necessary for good mental health. Mental health in this study tended to cost participants upward of $50 a week on coffee. And this was a while ago. Indeed, these consumers used the term free money when describing their personal overdrafts and bank loans that they used to support this type of spending. Of interest, these participants placed the purchase of groceries, the payment of rent, and the purchase of textbooks at the very bottom of their list of priorities for spending. Prior research in consumption tended to focus on compulsive or impulsive overconsumption of non-essential products. Finding that the behavior itself was largely unreasoned and that abstract decision-making applied. Essentially, that those with a problem with non-essential consumption were also those with a problem with self-control. What we found in these studies is that non-essential purchasing is often strongly tied to a reasoned, rational decision-making frame where consumers have constructed a need-based narrative that fulfills their identity motivations. To illustrate, consider the participant who told us, I have a very, very large number of dresses, like 21st kind of dresses, and every time I go shopping, I buy another one. You don't want to be the girl in the same dress in all the Insta photos. An interesting finding for me in these studies was the enduring connection between perceptions of the physical self and garment choice. With fashion not just cited as dictating how individuals perceived their body, but our bodies restricting us from moving between different identities when we wanted to. This wasn't a new concept regarding women, but these studies showed evidence of this as a growing concern for men, particularly young men. For example, in a study of young New Zealand males, participants noted the tension that they felt as Kiwi blokes who were proud of high performance on the rugby field, but then expressed dissatisfaction at their muscular thighs and how they couldn't squeeze into the skinny jeans for social situations that they felt were expected of them. Some of these participants spoke of wanting to have two separate identities that they could move between, but being forced into having only one and the unfairness of being forced into that by their bodies. They struggled then to articulate who they really felt they were or wanted to be by being prevented from consuming particular things in the way that they felt they needed. During this period, one study in 2015 marked the beginning of my interest in fashion as a central consumption issue with respect to the sustainable world. Working with a fantastic student, Rebecca, we explored what people knew and what they thought about the emerging concept of fashion sustainability. 
This paper was instrumental in stimulating a research trajectory that continues for me today. At the time, there was not much written on this topic internationally. So this paper filled a gap in our categorization of fashion consumer attitudes in a way that is still useful now. A key finding of this study, and one that remains relevant, was the lack of consensus amongst consumers on what sustainable fashion actually is. Some considered fabric. Some considered the human cost of production. Others, the life cycle of garments. Some consumers placed the burden of sustainability on others. Some placed it on themselves. Others expressed a strong lack of interest in the issue or in any behaviour change, deeming the problem as far less important than other sustainability foci. In recent years, we have come to realise the true cost of fashion. Fashion production is estimated to make up 10% of the world's carbon emissions is a significant polluter of all forms of water, and approximately 85% of all textiles produced will eventually go to landfill. The United Nations Environment Programme notes that the worldwide environmental impact of fashion is currently greater than that of all international flights and shipping combined. The second part of Dante's poem, Purgatorio, speaks to the nature of vice and virtue and moral issues. In this stage of my research, the topics are narrower, as I focused on the growing moral issue of consumption and sustainability, and what consumers understood about this issue. The question of consumption reduction or rejection of consumption, is an interesting one for a marketer, where many of us have skills in selling. However, if we consider consumer behaviour as a response mechanism driven by market stimuli, marketers are the people well positioned to drive change regarding the issues we care most about. In behaviour change research, we categorise measures designed to prompt new or altered behaviour as hard or soft. Soft measures might offer more choice and more alternatives in a market. Hard measures attempt to directly prompt change, re-educating consumers as part of that process. There is, however, significant evidence that hard measures may not be as effective as thought by those who seek to implement them. For example, in my work with my colleague, Dr. Robert Hamlin, where we explored mandated nutritional labeling on food products, we found that consumers would treat the mere presence of a label as a green light to purchase, ignoring the actual nutritional rating of the food. In other work, it became apparent that there was a disconnect between systems designed to manage perceived overconsumption, such as fashion rental or ride sharing, and how consumers used these systems, such as the fashion renters who pay little care to garments they don't own, shortening the lifespan to six wears, or the drivers who like the idea of ride sharing as long as it's their car, they make the decisions and they're not the ones to change any travel norms. In fashion research, there was a persistent belief that making better quality, harder wearing garments would improve overall sustainability outcomes. 
However, in work conducted with colleagues in Canada, South Korea and New Zealand, we found that consumers were motivated to hold on to, care for and repair or repurpose fast fashion if they had fallen in love with the garment and it helped them to achieve or manifest a particular identity. Equally, consumers were fast to dispose of high quality garments if they never really emotionally connected with the garment in the first place. The cost of so-called ethical fashion garments has been cited as part of the middle class luxury of embracing sustainability. The proponents of credit-based systems that allow consumers to purchase products in a pay later fashion suggest that they can help fill this gap. However, work we have conducted in this area tells us that such systems tend to promote excessive consumption among young, impressionable consumers, often in the fast fashion space. At the end of the poem, Dante finally understands what he sees. He ties the idea of ultimate understanding to the concept of reaching paradise. The notion that ultimate understanding might exist, but we're not quite there yet, is I suppose what keeps us researching and is central to what we believe in as academics. My current research seeks to highlight opportunities to increase consumer understanding of what they buy and how they use it. This would allow the consumer to make choices that fit their personal value structure and embrace their varied identities with some level of consideration. This research has shone a spotlight on a number of areas where the industry could serve consumers better. For example, where we agree that reducing the volume of textiles entering landfill is necessary, there is also strong evidence that some disposal of clothing is driven by a lack of repair resource, not disinterest in garment maintenance. Professional garment repair in New Zealand is expensive as are some of the tools required to undertake it, such as purchasing a sewing machine. Where community-based organisations offer access to machines and expertise and other tools, often these are not known about by those who don't have a particular interest in sewing as a hobby. Where basic textile skills are taught in schools, the focus tends to be on making rather than repairing or maintaining. And education is limited to younger children or to females, where some male high schools do not offer or encourage textiles as an optional subject at all. In terms of enabling consumers to make better or at least more informed choices, the labelling of textiles is largely unregulated and confusing. Garment manufacturers can effectively purchase a label that indicates a non-relative aspect of sustainability often only related to a minor part of the garment. Further, garment retailers can effectively invent their own sustainability labelling and put it right in the retail space in front of us. What does conscious garment even mean? Where terms are broadly understood by the market, a retailer can label something recycled, for example, when the reality may be that the garment is worse in terms of overall impact than another that is not made from recycled textile. The good news is, media around the world are equally as interested in these issues today, signalling a growing social awareness of opportunities for change. 
The diversity of people's interest and possessions speaks clearly to the role of things as a psychosocial mechanism used by individuals to construct the self-evaluative outcomes within which they are most happy. This is at the centre of the wicked problem that consumer behaviour researchers grapple with. Wicked problems do not have easy or singular solutions. And resistance to change is an indicator of the social complexity that lies behind why we as individuals buy what we buy. Where our self-esteem is inextricably linked to a need to form an identity, or many identities, as well as make that identity meaningful, possessions signify our ownership of the roles we create for ourselves. Just as those who are interested in fashion might have too many clothes, so too might the academic have too many books, so might the surfer have too many surfboards, or the gamer too many in-game purchases. My current research does not seek to tell people that they can't enjoy their things. My co-researchers and I are interested in how we can better equip people with the tools they need to make different choices. Achieving the bearable weight of being that Nietzsche suggested was integral to a good life. So here we are at the end that I promised, and I would like to turn to some notes of thanks. Firstly, I would like to thank my colleagues, both current and past, in the Department of Marketing. I have been very fortunate to make some very good friends in our department and appreciate the help and support of these colleagues along the way, some of whom are here tonight. When I started in the department, I believe we numbered almost into the 30s. So I won't attempt to list every individual because I really would not want to leave any one person out. I want to thank my wonderful research students, some of whom I see here, and past students who have worked with me on many of these projects. Thank you to my co-authors, particularly Dr Robert Hamlin and Dr Rachel McQueen, where our collaborations underpin the work discussed tonight. I would also like to thank my family and friends from outside the university for their ongoing love and support. Hamish, Roman, Ethan, I promise this is the one and only lecture you will ever need to attend. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thank all of you for coming along tonight. Kia ora, everybody. So Nakoto Katoa, Core Rob Lawson, Toku Ingoa. I've been asked as a former head of department to give a vote of thanks for Lisa for her excellent and absorbing lecture this evening. I think it's delighted to do this. I was working out that it was actually on my watch as head of department that Lisa will have been first appointed to a position at Otago. And so that makes it all a little bit special, I think, uh, to recognize that she has enjoyed her whole academic career here. So tonight we ought to say thank you uh, to Lisa, not just for this lecture, but for all the contributions she's made to the university over the last 20 years or so. It, it is clear that Lisa has established a very strong international reputation for her work with many uh, good collaborations. 
I did a quick uh, count up and um, I found over two and a half thousand citations by other researchers to her work, which I think is pretty impressive. So, well done, Lisa. If there's one thing from tonight's talk and from her work which I would focus on and take away as a sort of key finding just to um, uh, substantiate what she's uh, talking about, it's this relationship between possessions and identity and how they really become synonymous. And that's, although most of Lisa's work has taken place in the context of fashion, that's clearly a lesson that we can take into other areas. For other people, it may be food, it may be cars, it may be music. Uh, but that's an important lesson to realize because it helps explain when possessions and consumption are so strongly linked to identity, how behavior change becomes so difficult to enact and why on many occasions consumption can appear almost to be self-destructive. I like the reference and the quote that Lisa made to the, about the lady with a um, wardrobe full of 21st dresses. It's immaterial how many dresses she has. There's no declining marginal utility as we would get from other, other, other theories and other subjects. Each occasion requires a new identity or a reinforcement of an identity with a new possession. possession. That's a different reality from a lot of traditional consumer behavior research. So on that basis, somewhere down here, I would like to ask Lisa to accept a small token of appreciation from the university for her work and for tonight's lecture.